Well, today we, let's see, we finished chapter 7, didn't we? We did. So today we go over chapter 7 homework. And then we start chapter eight. Ooh, excuse me. Do you have any questions from chapter seven? Do you have any other questions? Mr. Bailey. Oh, dear. Six twenty five and twenty nine. Well, let's save chapter five questions until we're done with everything else today. Looks like you're only missing two things on twenty nine. You also have a test to take for chapters one through five that you need to try to crank out this week so that you can be all caught up. But at the end of class today, we can do some we can do some chapter five if you need to still. Did you have any questions about Chapter 7 homework at all? Um, a couple about specific questions, but also I think it might have, at least it wouldn't let me read a text question if I got those wrong. What, you what? It wouldn't let me read a questions for Chapter 7. Uh, I was wondering if it was going to give me problems. Uh, 
It's, well, it depends on the question, of course. Multiple choice questions can be one attempt. I was going to tell you. Let me see here. Yeah, so that actually changed it again. It should be seven. Is it just kind of random to change on it? Sometimes this this new when they when they handed the system over to this company that's maintaining it now, it's got some glitches in it that they need to fix. They've done some changes that make it easier for people to change things, but also that aren't very stable, I think, in the program. So check and see if it. In what? On number one. For chapter seven. Because what I was looking at was the fact that it said there was a force being applied to it, but it was also moving in constant velocity. So in my head I was thinking of the frictional force and the forces. The applied force should be exactly the same if it's moving in constant velocity, right? Mm -hmm. No, the force just means that it's accelerating it. It can still have velocity. Yeah, it should be frictional force and the pushing force should be exactly the same. And that's what I put, and it said that the frictional force was wrong. But it's not asking for the frictional force, it's asking how much work is done by the force. So the frictional force is exactly the same as the pushing force because the overall force has to add to zero. But they're not asking for the frictional force. They're asking for the work done by the frictional force. And that would just be negative, right? It would be a, it would be a negative amount of work. And it would be the 220 newtons times what? It'd be the, uh, Times the it's it's like and the reason it's negative is because the cosine of the angle between them is 180. Well, the oh, angle between oh, them is 180, oh. so the cosine of that is negative 1. Right? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I should probably bring up the screen here. So the frictional force is backwards, but the movement is forwards. So since they're oppo opposing directions, the angle between them is 180 degrees. And work is calculated by force times distance times the cosine of the angle between the force and the distance, or the force and the displacement. And that gives you cosine of 180 degrees, which is negative 1. Of course, all these answers are really quite simple. Once you understand the problem, you can do them in your head almost, right? If I give too many more than one attempt, it'll be too easy to do. Yeah. So I could maybe do two attempts on this one, but... Okay. Um, so air exerts force on a parachute as the parachute just falls toward the earth. And they want to know, work is being done on the second arm with a positive or negative value. So, when does something have a positive value in the equation? Force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them. The cosine is what determines the sign, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're both going, if the force is pushing in the same direction that the object is moving, then the angle between them is what? Zero. Which cosine of zero is? One. one. 
So that's when it's positive, when they're pushing, when it's pushing and moving in the same direction. But if they're pushing and moving in opposite directions, if the pushing is opposite to the movement, then it becomes negative. And a parachute pushes the, the parachutist up while the parachutist is falling down. Okay, because I was thinking, I guess I still have a few more implications in my head of like putting a, like an XY coordinate and up is always positive. So that's what I got there. Up can be positive, but down would be negative. So the cosine of the angle between them would be negative. So essentially what happen, what, what always happens is if you have a force that slows you down, it's always negative work. If you have a force that speeds you up, it's always positive work, and that's kind of how it goes. Okay. Work always either adds energy to the system or takes energy away from the system. When it adds energy to the system, it's positive. When it takes energy away, it's negative. Whoa. Uh. Let's see if I can. Is this is number twelve. Number twelve and twenty-four. I also have. Uh, I was looking at the map, and I forgot that uh, you're supposed to. It's talking about the uh, kinetic energy, one half mass times velocity squared, and I was comparing them while I could count the squared, so I got a part of that one. But I know what I did now. So. Oh, so I, I'm going to change number 12 to two attempts. So, what was the next one you had a question about? Sorry? Um, I don't have a question on number 24, but it was the same way. It was only allowed in the uh, one minute. I got the last part wrong just because I forgot that in the equation there's a velocity squared. 24. I'll give you two attempts on that one, too. There you go. So for that first part was asking the work, you would use the F E cosine of theta. Right? For the work? Sure. Um, There's an easier way, but I mean it's uh, you you can do that, but it's a little bit you have to figure out what is that theta and in this um, I was just gonna say theta is zero, so it's one. Well theta is theta zero, you have to make sure that it is, right? So your force is positive, and the displacement is also positive, so I guess it is zero. Right? Okay. You have to just figure that out from the graph to make sure. But an even easier way to do it from the graph is that the, we talked about this at one point, the area between the curve and the axis, the x-axis on a displacement force graph, is the work. So this is a triangle with area with a base two with a height five, so it's two times five times one half. So it's five. And then just do the area under the and the area under this. Yeah, if you want to do the whole thing. Oh okay. That's hmm. so it's just the total area. For 
I would use the work energy theorem that says the work that you do on something changes the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy um, starts at rest, so the initial kinetic energy is zero, and then the final kinetic energy is one half mv final squared. So you'd end up with an equation that says one half mv final squared equals the total work. And then you solve for b. So who's coming to this meeting tonight about the eclipse? You coming? You coming too? Should be less than an hour. Mm -hmm. Seven o'clock in the theater or in the next other the other building. Yeah, they're going to talk about the science of the eclipse and other things, and uh, they're going to talk about a project that they're doing. They're going to invite everybody to be a part of their. They're going to take a mega video of the eclipse of people all across the United States watching the eclipse. Take a video of the eclipse with their cell phones and then they're going to stitch all these videos together. When is the eclipse? Eclipse is on August 21st, which is a Monday, it's like 11.40. That's what I thought you were asking is if we're going to walk the eclipse and I'm like, that was later in the year. Yeah, that is later in the year. But I would, uh, if you're, if you're going to come, I I would uh, ask if you want to volunteer to hand out eclipse packets. I've made all these eclipse packets. <clears throat> They're envelopes with glasses and activities in them. So if you're willing, uh, try to find me at one of the doors to the theater, and I'll have you sit at a table and hand out eclipse packets. So if you can come maybe five or ten minutes early, ten minutes early probably, ten to fifteen minutes early, It'd be great. And if you come ten minutes early and help me out hand out Eclipse packets, I'll give you a free T-shirt, so you can look like a STEM club member. You want to see our STEM club T-shirts? Here's our stamp club t shirt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that equation means? No. You ever heard of Schrodinger and his cat? Mm -hmm. That's Schrodinger's equation. That's the cat equation. Right <laughs> <laughs> what I think is funny is that most people, like 90% of people that are just skim over that second part, they don't even try to. Yeah. <laughs> Although physicists and engineers will look at it and laugh with a true understanding. So if you wear it tonight, and the scientists that come to visit, they will laugh at it. I'm thinking I'll give them, as well, give them a t-shirt as well. But um, yeah, we made those last year. We have a bunch of STEM t-shirts, actually. We have some that are like, like I have one that says, I found this humorous, and it's got a great big bone, the humorous bone. <laughs> That's my favorite one. That's the one I always wear. And we have one that has the caffeine molecule on it. You know, a little model of the caffeine molecule. One of, one of them has uh, oxygen magnesium on it, so it's an OMG t-shirt. What's another one we do? We've got thank you cards. We've got STEM Club thank you cards.
I can't find it right now, but it's thank you from the head of the periodic table as well. It's thorium, nitrogen, uh, thorium, nitrogen, potassium, deuterium, oxygen, uranium. So it's thank you without an A. From the periodic table. When people give us donations and things, we send them a thank you card. But <clears throat> we have a lot of. We also have the brain. We have the brainy bunch T-shirt. It's got a bunch of pictures of scientists on it. Is that the brainy bunch? That's right. It looks like the Brady bunch, but it's the brainy bunch. Here, I'll show you something else. We did. See if I can find it. Where is it? Five. <laughs> sure you do. Remember, we're not dealing with kinematics. We're just dealing with conservation of energy. We're just doing, we're just measuring energy. There's some energy at the top, and there's energy at the bottom. And we have to figure out what happens to the energy. So how much, what kind of energies are at, at the, do we have at the top of the track? Is it moving when it goes to, when it's at the top? No, we're just holding it there. There's no kinetic energy, it's just gravitational potential. So gravitational potential energy at the top, right? So what is gravitational potential energy? That's Mass times gravity times height. So that's the only energy it has at the top. Then we let it go and it slides down without friction until it gets to this bumpy part and then it has friction. So it slides down and then friction does what to the energy that we have? First of all, the energy turns into kinetic energy, right, as it comes down. But the, what takes the kinetic energy away? Friction. Friction. What does friction do to the block? by doing what on the block? We call it work, right? Mm -hmm. So in the end, what happens is you have an equation that looks like this. The two many things left over on the right one. I've, I've, I've got this habit from my physics teacher in high school. My physics teacher in high school was blind. And he still thought he could write on chalkboards. So he would just write on chalkboards, and then he would forget that he'd written on the chalkboard, and then he would turn around and write on the chalkboard again. By the end of the day, you'd have five things on top of each other. We'd never stop them because it was just hilarious. But he was blind. I mean, he was so blind. He was he was he could see shadows, but just barely. He, he had this big screen in his room where he could put your paper underneath this camera, and it would blow it up on this screen, and each letter would fill the screen, and he'd read papers out. He would put his face right up against the screen and figure out the shape of the letter and read. And he was really fast at it. But these, these big letters would go by and he'd read your papers. But he just could not see the board, so he would always draw things on top of other things. But anyway, the point is, is that I do that myself. So, uh, what we've got is we've got this ramp here, we've got some friction down here. We're starting with some energy up here, which the energy total up here is equal to uh, gravitational potential energy, E gravitational, which is equal to MGH. And the H is going to be the height between here and here, right? When it gets down here, it has some kinetic, uh, its energy is all kinetic energy. The total energy has changed all to kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared. But we really don't need that unless they ask us for the velocity, do they? They do, yes. so we're going to need that. So from here to here, this energy turns into this energy. So you have to set it equal to say that mvh becomes and is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom because there's no friction in between. If there was friction in between, some of it would go into friction, but there isn't, so it's going to have mv squared. So you use that to solve for v squared. But then when it slows down, you have to set this also, this is also equal to the amount of work done by the friction. And it's technically equal to negative the work done by the friction. Negative the work done is negative the force times the displacement times the cosine of theta. Now, the cosine of theta is going to give you a negative one, which is going to cancel that negative one. But it ends up being the force of friction, which is mu times n times the distance that the friction acts. So first, we use this equation to calculate velocity. 
And then once you've got a number for the kinetic energy or this one, whatever one, you set it up for this one and solve for the uh, other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you do when you solve this one. You solve for B. No, once you, you solve for B here, and then you take either this one or this one and set it equal to this one, and you solve for B. And setting them equal to each other, you don't know the velocity and the mass. So if you divide the mass over the, the mass, mass, is going to cancel out here, so it yeah. doesn't matter. And it's going to cancel out of this one as well, because the normal force in this case is going to be m times g, right? Because it's on a horizontal plane. So this normal force ends up being m times g. So the mass goes way ahead of the normal. We don't need the normal. Chances out here, here, So your first, equation, your first equation is solve this gh equals one half d squared. Your second equation is solve gh equals mu d, mu g d. And you can cross out the g as well. So it's just h equals mu d, right? Second one. Didn't I tell you this chapter's easy? Well, the math is easy. Setting up the problems isn't always easy, but the math is usually pretty easy. Once I get the problems set up, I don't have the problems with the math. It's just Set up. Setting it up is almost always the hardest part of physics. Mm -hmm. And that's really the big difference between physics and engineering and all the mathematical classes, all the math classes in the book, is that we, we get to this point in our mathematical experience or mathematical life that the easy part is the math. The, the hard part is figuring out how you're going to use the math, <laughs> where you're going to use it, how you're going to use it. That really is the very, the very hardest part. And it was true in math classes as well. You know, the hardest part was figuring out how train A and train B both leave Denver at the same time. Or, you know, what it is that you're going to use. And then once you actually figure that out, then solving is the easy part. It's just the difference. <laughs> once we get the, um, once we have uh, the equation that we have here, the you can use that to find the kinetic energy and set that equal to... Well, you don't even have to because the last equation, the g's all cancel out and you get this. h equals mu times d and you can just say d equals h over mu. Do you have mu? Yeah. Yeah, so you're good to go. <clears throat> this guy right here, Richard Feynman, the greatest American physicist of all time, without a doubt in my mind. There were some great American physicists, but he was truly phenomenal. And uh, he earned a Nobel Prize in some ways. Uh, one of the things that he was really famous for is he was the youngest scientist on the Manhattan Project. He went to Los Alamos at the age of 17 or 18. And uh, he was kind of a goofy, goofy guy, though. For example, um, he... And there's a great movie about him called Infinity, where Matthew Broderick plays him. Uh, but when he, when he first got up to Los Alamos, they were still building the fences around the laboratory to where they were building the nuclear bomb. Los Alamos is where they were building the actual package of uranium and plutonium for the bombs. They were actually doing the plutonium one, there, not the uranium one. But, um, and that's the, the project that he was on, was this plutonium project. But when he got up there, they bust them up there on these buses on this, this edge of this cliff. And they were still building the fences. And, the, and all the scientists were being forced to go through this checkpoint gate with all these, you know, military guards and all this stuff, guns and, and check, you know, check your ID and all this stuff. But all the construction workers were going through a hole in the fence not 20 feet away. And they were just going in and out a hole in the fence. And so, so Richard Feynman goes in the checkpoint, and then he goes back out the hole in the fence, and he comes back up to the checkpoint. And he did this like five times before they realized they'd checked him into this top secret facility five times, and they threw him in the brick. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing that he had to do was convince the people at, at, uh, at Los Alamos that he wasn't a, a Russian spy. And finally, uh, the director up there, who was uh, the very famous Oppenheimer, 
um, got him out of jail. <laughs> but that's the kind of person he was. He was always the kind of person to joke around, to be very interesting. One of the other things that he did while he was up there is he noticed that <clears throat> he noticed that um, the file cabinets, which all had locks on them, um, he noticed that when you turn the the the, the dial for the uh, combination, that every time it passed a number that was part of your combination, it would bump the it would it would put a little bump on the little latch that locks it. And he noticed that in his own. And he also noticed that most people never change their lock from the standard, from the, from the lock that it comes with. From the, they never change their combination from the combination that the factory sets it up. And so he started going around to people's offices and just having conversations with them. And while he was having conversations, he checked to see what their combination was, checked to see if they changed it. And over the course of like a year, he memorized everybody's combination. He memorized everybody who had not changed their combination, first of all. And then the ones who did, he memorized their combination just by turning the thing idly while he was talking to them. You know, just stick his hand up there and just fiddle with it. And uh, and then when people were out on vac when they were on vacation with their families or something else, and somebody needed something, he would go and break into their file cabinets and get it. <laughs> and it, it turned out to be very useful, but he got caught doing that too. They're like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Well, nobody changed their combinations, and those who do, it's easy to figure it out." <laughs> But the reason I say this is because of this problem of setting up the problems. He, had, he actually had a very deep approach to mathematics. He, he thought that the best way to solve very difficult, impossible, really, mathematical problems was to create an analog in physics, to look at the natural world and say, what does this mathematics relate to in, in, the, real, in the real world, in the real universe? And then to take the solution in the real universe from observation and apply it backwards to the math to solve the math problem. And when he was a professor, I think at Yale or something like that, um, every lunchtime he would go to lunch with all these math professors, and they would bring him a problem that was impossible to solve. Mathematicians had not been able to solve it. And every time he solved it before lunch was over, every single time. And that's how he did it. He never did any math, he never wrote anything down, he would just think about what it would, what this equation or what this what this math problem would relate to in, in, the, in the universe, and then he said, "Well, this is the solution in the real world. That must be the solution of mathematics." And then they retranslated it back back into mathematics. He was brilliant, one of the most brilliant people ever, without a doubt. So, when he got the Nobel Prize, he asked his good friend, oh, "Who was that?" Hans Bethe, no, 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 another American. It was, uh, uh, can't remember who it was, but another American who just received the Nobel Prize a few years earlier. He asked him if he could refuse it because he didn't want the Nobel Prize and he, and he didn't want the notoriety. He didn't want anybody to think him, of him as famous. And the guy said, Well, if you do, you'll be more famous for rejecting it than <laughs> you would ever be for receiving it. <laughs> So he went to receive the Nobel Prize and he went back to his For two years he left the United States and went to Brazil to learn how to play the, the conga drum. Conga drums. That was the only reason. Yeah. He went there, he, well, not the only reason. He did, he did uh, work at a university for a while now, they're doing some research. But his primary reason is he really wanted to do, live the Brazilian lifestyle and he wanted to play the conga drums in the Rio de Janeiro Carnival Parade. Which he did. At the end of his two years, he became quite the conga drum player. Um. <laughs> he was a character, without a doubt. But it's a really good movie. Infinity tells the story of him when he was young. There's his his autobiography is in four volumes, I think. The first volume is called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. The second one is called um, um, all, the, all the volumes have these funny names. I've got two or three of them, but um, they're really interesting books. He was a character about that. One time somebody told him, you can't treat women with respect or they'll never like you. And he's like, what? It doesn't make any sense, because he was always very respectful of women. He actually, he actually was married at a very young age to his high school sweetheart. But she died of cancer while he was at Los Alamos. 
and she was in the cancer hospital in Albuquerque the whole time he was in Los Alamos. So he would leave campus at Los Alamos and drive 150 miles to go visit his wife every weekend. But, um, but he was very respectful of women all of his life, and I think partly because he lost his wife in a young age. But he just wanted to know if that was true, so he went down to a bar and started treating women badly all night. He's like, it doesn't work out so well. <laughs> um, He's just that kind of person. He has to try everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a weird guy. So, um, anyway. On this number two problem. Number two? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it could. Normal force isn't really doing any work because it's not moving him away from the ice slope. Right? Yep. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure of. Normal force is perpendicular to his movement, so it's not doing any work. However, the normal force is creating the friction. So it's involved in the friction, but it's not itself doing any work. The, um, Frictional force. We have the new component, the normal force, which is just still the uh, mass time of gravity, right? That hasn't changed when we're talking about work, right? The what? I'm sorry? Is the normal force still mass time of gravity? No, because it's only on a horizontal on a horizontal surface that it's mass time of gravity. Okay. So this one, you have two components to your force, uh, to your uh, weight force, right? You have the force that is perpendicular, which would be opposite the normal force, and then the force that is parallel to that surface. And that force that is parallel to the surface is the one that you have to counteract to lower them down at a constant velocity. So that one's going to give you the force that they're lowering them with. It'll also give you the force of friction, because friction has to counteract that. Okay. So the... Um Because I remember we did a lot of these where it was like flipping the axes. To yep, and that's what you're going to do here. So the mass times gravity gives us the one that just goes straight down. That's this one right here. Yep. So then we also have to use either the trigonometry, the Pythagorean theorem to find the x and y. Yep. Okay. Trigonometry we have to use for sure. So many great physicists throughout the ages. Kind of sucks that only really, you said finally, the only one that was American. Was really great, right? Well, there are some others. Uh, Rosalind. Uh, Ro what's her name? I can't remember. She is American. Um, one of these guys is American. Austin Howard is American. Is this or what is it? What's that? What's Stephen Hawking? What's He's English. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's British. Uh, Stephen Hawking's over here, I think. He's British. Um, let's see, who else was, was American in those pictures? Einstein. Einstein's German. He grew up in Switzerland, but he's German. And aren't most of the great physicists then either English? Many of them were because that's uh, many of them were. Um, there were a lot of famous scientists from Europe at the, in the 1800s and in the early 20, 20th century, and a big part of that was because that's where so much there were so many. Um, that's where all the big universities were thriving. Research in, in scientific research in the in the earlier 1800s and the late 1700s, you had a lot of really wealthy um, noblemen, no, you know, noble families that were supporting the research, and so the research was uh, was in Europe where the money was. But at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, the United States started to take over 
the money world from Europe. Uh, essentially, when oil came around, when, when we started using oil, the United States became wealthy because we're the only ones who have oil. So we discovered oil in Alaska, we discovered oil in Texas, we discovered oil in the Gulf, we, and Pennsylvania. We had lots of oil in Pennsylvania. We had all the oil. And so uh, we became very, very wealthy at the beginning of the 20th century. And we used that wealth to build universities, to, to promote uh, education, to promote science. And, uh, and that was kind of the beginning of the scientific revolution in, in the United States. And even, you know, scientists like Einstein left Europe and came to the United States because of the wars. The wars in Europe didn't help. We didn't have any wars in the United States. We never had a war in the United States in the 20th century. We had war, you know, the United States fought wars in the in, uh, Philippines and in all kinds of places, in Korea and in Europe. We fought in Europe twice and all these things, but we never fought in the United States. So we were very stable. Uh, so scientists started coming to the United States to do all the work, ones that would be uh, welcome to them. And that's really what changed us, is that we had all these great scientists that moved here for the stability and safety. So built our universities, and now we're the premier place for universities for science. Do you consider him a Tesla physicist? Oh, yeah. More. But he was, yes. uh, what's that? He was also a physicist. He was, he was definitely, there's a lot of crossover. Uh, inventors, engineers, physicists, you know, philosophers even. There's a lot of crossover there. And there's a good reason for that because a lot of those things are all interconnected. You can't really be one without the other. It's very, even Einstein, who was almost purely a theoretical physicist, the most theoretical physicist ever, he started out doing the same thing in Tesla. He was building power plants with his dad and they were trying to figure out a way to bring power to, uh, to Europe, and then he was a patent clerk. I mean, he was, he was essentially a technical engineer uh, when he was in college. And those are the things that, that, uh, that really get people to start thinking. You know, it wasn't that Einstein just came up with these ideas just by sitting around doing nothing. He sat around and did things with his hands and he figured things out with his mind. <clears throat> so that's, I mean, my father is an is a astrophysicist by education. He was an engineer by trade, but he was an inventor. He had 12 patents to his name. So that's not abnormal. It's very common. My next door neighbor back home was an engineer by education. He was an engineer by trade, but he's now a businessman by that because he invented this new platform for spying on other countries. He makes these huge balloons that they send up into the sky and they've got them all over the Middle East and all over uh, Europe now. And this company that he owns makes these balloons and sells them to the military in different countries. They put cameras on them and sensors and radar and everything else. Way cheaper than having planes up in the sky, way cheaper than, uh, than anything else, and they're much more effective as well. And he's, he's a multimillionaire now, and he's a businessman. <laughs> That's not uncommon. Once again, it's very common. So... Lots of crossover. Yeah, and that's another good example of that. He's not only an inventor, but also an engineer, and also a really good physicist. I mean, the guy knew his stuff. So. He, was, he was the original workaholic. Yeah, he was certainly one of them. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Thomas Edison. There's a light bulb in my hometown that has been burning for over a hundred years. It's the longest burning light bulb in the world. Let's see if we can find it. Really? Right. Um, How do you keep that continuously burning? How did it not burn out? First of all, it's been, it was made uh, really well. So this is the light bulb here. 
and it's in a firehouse in my hometown in, in Livermore. And they turn it way down, so it's made a lot different. It's a, I believe it's a carbon filament. So carbon filaments are a little bit more, um, last a little bit longer than, than tungsten filaments, for example. But um, they turn it way down in, in current so that it could last longer. And, it's, and also it was just really well made. It was made back in the time when, when light bulbs were made by hand. And this one just happened to be made extremely well. So the idea is that you have to keep all the air out of the bulb. The bulb has to be full of nothing. It has to have nothing in it. If there's something in it, a contaminant, that contaminant will heat up and stick to the, stick to the filament and cause a hot spot on the filament, and then that will melt the filament, and then it will die. So they turn it way down, and they put it on a very special energy, or special electrical um, circuit so that it doesn't get interrupted. But I, this is one of our field trips when we were kids to go see this light bulb in our town hanging in the fire station. And it's been there since. Let's see if they say when it's been there. 116, so installed in 1901, 116 years old, at least. It's been turned off a couple of times when they had to rebuild, and it's been turned off by power outages before. But it's still, they turn it right back on as soon as they can. And, been around so a long time. Long yep. Here's a here's a camera uh, camera of it right now. At two sixteen was the last time we took a picture, which was just two minutes ago. One minute. <laughs> two sixteen California. Time. There's the bulb cam. That's an ancient camera. <laughs> Here are people. People are touring right now. I'm looking at it. People always come to look at it. I have an old fire truck back in there too. Yeah, it's right near where I used to coach swimming actually. There's a swim coach right behind that fire station. My town, considering that it's such a tiny little podunk town in California, has actually got a lot of claims to fame. You have the National Emission Facility, the biggest laser in the world. In fact, there are 196 lasers, 198 lasers, 196. And each one of those lasers is the biggest laser in the world on its own. But then they're all combined into one laser facility. This wow. is what this is what one of the laser bays looked like. There's four of these. This is the. Um, I mean, here's a nice view. Of, where's a nice view of the target chamber? Here's a nice view of the target chamber. So the target chamber is like five or six stories tall. So you can see the guy standing there. Each one of these holes is where one of the lasers comes through, and they all focus down on this tiny little target. This target right here is smaller than your pinky. And they put a little piece of tritium inside here encased in gold. So this is what it looks like. This is the target right here, this little sphere of gold. And then the lasers come from all directions. And they, they come in the ends of that little cylinder. And they, as they bounce off this cylinder, they vaporize the cylinder. But all the energy gets, compresses this sphere that's just this tiny little sphere. And compresses it a thousand times or more smaller than it was and they create a star. They create a little star in the middle of this thing. And it's actually a much hotter and much more energetic star than our own sun. But it's just very, very tiny. <laughs> so they create a little tiny star in there. That's cool. It is really cool. It's actually really hot. But... So they make it out of gold, right? Yeah, the, the, target, the target sphere is, is usually made out of gold. They, they have different targets they use for different things. But it's usually something like this with the cylinder and the so gold target. The uh, Here they are putting that thing in. No, what's inside the gold is what is the fusion. Inside the gold, the gold is filled with deuterium and tritium usually, and that's oh, what that's what. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So, because I was going to say, I remember like when a star is dying, it will start trying to fuse gold, either gold or iron. 
Well, yeah, when, when a star, as, as the energy from a star moves outward in its corona, into its corona, it's creating heavier elements like iron and other things. Gold, most gold around is actually created in the, in the fusion processes in the earth. But, um, but as the star is dying, it can start creating heavier elements like lead and gold and other things. And it's all on the side of the star. Yeah, it is. In fact, so here is a, so you know that most lasers are made by, by energizing the material, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, um, well, there's, there's one of the little targets, so you can see how big it is. One of the little target cylinders, um, a different type of one, but uh, let's see if I can find this picture. They actually use a type of ruby, which is a, it's actually a sapphire, but so are rubies. <laughs> See if I can find some of the sapphires they use. This is actually some of the thin film sapphire they use there. But they the, they needed such big crystals um, that they had to invent a new process for creating crystal. I'm trying to find it here. It's incredible. What the heck is that? Let's go back to, oh. here it is, <laughs> I love this picture. You know the candy um, Jolly Ranchers? Doesn't that look like a huge Jolly Rancher? <laughs> they actually use the same process that, they, that is used, they, they, they got their idea from the candy industry, from making Jolly Ranchers. So Jolly Ranchers are just a huge sugar crystal yeah. that rolls off an assembly line and they just chunk it, you know, they just chop it. And they use that same idea to create these continuous crystals that come out of this machine. But these crystals are essentially rubies. And the, the ruby is, it comes off in this, you know, wrinkly thing that looks like candy. And then when they shave it down and cut it down and polish it and flatten it perfectly, these things are so flat it's almost unmeasurable so perfectly flat so perfectly optically clean it's almost unmeasurable but they it turn them into these crystals um, that are used they're essentially used as amplifiers here's a picture of, of what it looks like when it's in the actual machine they have just hundreds of these things that are used to amplify the the laser to, to make the light uh, bigger and smaller and more strong stronger and stronger and stronger and so they're like big, uh, they're big uh, Jolly Rancher crystals. <laughs> that's what I like to call them. But it's amazing. I mean, that's a sapphire that is so big. And then they, they had to invent a new machine for, for making prisms and things too. They invented a, um, let's see if I can find the... Uh, if they're using... That's used to amplify. What do they use? What do they excite to make the laser itself? Uh, they actually, let's see if I can remember. I think they actually use, uh, I can't remember. Well, it's actually, it's just, I think it's crystals the whole way. Um, the amplifiers are the, are the thing that make the crystal. They are the thing that make the laser. So, um, they actually have two sets of them. They have one that makes the actual light, and the, that makes the actual laser light the first time. And that laser light is in the infrared range, but they need laser light that's in ultraviolet. And so they actually have to double it, and they use a different crystal for doubling it. So it doubles the frequency, which cuts the wavelength in half and increases the, so it, it turns it essentially from red light into ultraviolet light. And uh, they have this great machine that they invented for cutting these things. It's, a, it's like a mill, but the tool is on this articulating robotic arm that can just do anything. It's just amazing. Here it is. So you have this optic that you're creating, and this robotic arm comes down, 
and it can turn any way it wants to. We call it the large optics diamond turning machine. And it can come down at any angle and cut any shape out of the material that you want. There's not a better picture of it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions before you take off? Are you good to go? Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I have a question about number two. Number two. I just want to make sure I'm approaching it right. Okay. So I went through and found. Um, so to find the force, the work done by the force of friction, um, I went and found the normal force that would be perpendicular, so the F, the force, the F elements on the yep. diagram. By using the funny the way the normal force is going to be the same, like just the ones that go straight up and down. Yep. And then when you use some trigonometry like sine of theta with that, you get the perpendicular normal force. Put that in with the coefficient of friction, and then you just have to, to find the work, you just have to change it from newtons to joules so you the meters that it's been. So you multiply it by the, the distance. And that's. To and get that's what I did to find the, the work that the friction is doing. And so for the tension, that would be the same as finding the, uh, the parallel normal force, right? Or the parallel rate, whichever sensation sure. is saying. And then you would just do the same thing and multiply it times the distance it's moving. Cool. Actually, I'm kind of happy that it will. Okay. All right, well, let's actually, I, I feel bad he just left because we hadn't quite gotten to chapter 8, but we need to talk about chapter 8 a little bit. We're not going to necessarily talk about homework with chapter 8, but we are going to talk a little bit about what momentum is and what conservation momentum is. Talk a little bit about collisions because um, this is going to be important for our lab, our lab tomorrow. So what is momentum? Momentum is another one of these things that is conserved in nature. We just talked about the fact that energy is conserved. Energy is not created or destroyed. Well, linear momentum, or momentum in general, is even more conserved than energy. Momentum is, is, a, con is a conserved quantity, and it has never been observed to be not conserved in any way, shape, or form. What exactly is momentum? Well, that's what we're going to answer right now. Awesome. Momentum, and, it, and it, was, it was a long a long argument for hundreds of years even, if something, if you multiply the mass times the velocity of an object, and the velocity now as a vector, so momentum as a vector, that, it, that quantity is conserved. But they didn't know if that was energy or if it was momentum. They had a hard time deciding which was which. And finally they decided that momentum was going to be a vector quantity that is conserved, and energy had no vector component. That's, that's kind of what it came down to. And it came down to uh, a bunch of experiments that were done in the 1700s and 1800s. But this quantity, the, the momentum of an object, is a conserved quantity. So P stands for the momentum. That's right. P is the linear momentum, and it is bold, boldified here so that it is a vector. It has direction as well as um, a value, strength. And it's equal to the mass times the velocity of the object. It's pretty simple. But do remember it has a direction, and the direction is conserved as much as the magnitude is conserved. So that's important. So uh, let's calculate some momentums. You have a 110 kilogram football player running eight meters per second. What's their momentum? Uh, it's M times V will give you the magnitude of their momentum. So you just multiply the two numbers to it, it gives you the magnitude. And the direction is in the same direction that they're running because it follows the velocity. And what do you measure momentum? Momentum does not have its own unit. Nobody's done anything amazing enough with momentum to have it named after them, I guess. So it's just in kilogram meters per second. It doesn't have its own name. Maybe we should, we should, we should rally the world to name it after me. But, I was just thinking about trying to make it so that they would name it after me. But you mentioned all the 880 Ferris's. I think really it should be, I really, I really think they should name it after uh, Marie 
du Châtelet, it should be called the Châtelet, or the Marie, because she was instrumental in figuring these things out, but nobody named anything after women back then, so it's never going to, I don't think it'll catch on, unfortunately. But anyway, um, that was back in the 1700s and 1800s. Are there any women surviving after the woman? The Curie. What is the Curie measure? It measures uh, exposure to radiation. And yeah. she died of that. Yeah, well, that makes sense why yes. it would be called named after her. Yeah, and I don't think she's the only one. I can't think of any others at this moment. But the Curie is certainly the most prevalent one. Um, so, here, uh, part B, we have a ball. Um, we have the player's momentum with the momentum of a hard-thrown ball, 0.4 kilograms, speed of 25 meters per second. So the momentum of the ball is 10.3 kilograms meters per second. We multiply those numbers together. Compare them, take one and divide by the other. It's an 85.9 differential, right? He's really, he has a lot more momentum. He has 85.9 times more momentum than a ball does, right? So even though I would, so, the reason that he has more momentum, even though the ball is thrown a lot faster than he is, is, is the mass. Is mass is yeah. So this is why when a player catches a ball, it doesn't really affect the player very much. Because they do absorb the momentum of the ball, and so their, ball, their momentum and the ball's momentum combine to make a new momentum for the new system, the ball player system when they catch it. But it doesn't really affect the player as much as it affects the ball, right? The ball tends to stop, it, it looks like it's stopping, it's not stopping. But the player's movement plays a bigger role than the ball's movement in their overall movement when they're done. And this is kind of interesting when we talk about movies, right? In movies, you have people that get shot by a gun, and the bullet hits them, and they go flying across the room, or they get thrown against the wall, or something else like that. But in real life, it doesn't happen. Not even with a big bullet at close range. Because the momentum of the bullet is extremely small compared to the momentum of the person. And you can tell that by the person who shoots the gun. Because the person who shoots the gun also absorbs momentum. If they, if they were shooting a bullet that was pushing people around, they would get pushed around. And it just doesn't happen with guns. You know, there's not a gun out there that will make you fly across the room. Even, I mean, a 50 caliber, you know, machine gun. Sure, but an artillery shell is the size of a human. <laughs> But, you know, a 50 caliber machine gun won't even do that to a person. You can, you can fire a 50 caliber machine gun. It will hurt and it will push you around a little bit, but it's not going to throw you across the room. Um, so, have that... You ever, sort of, with, uh, have you ever seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies? That's what I was saying. Yeah. The yeah. The yes. The part where, like, yeah. the he fires the big old gun. Yeah. 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 And then later in the movie, he makes sure so you'll really know if you're a physicist, you'll really know that you've, you've arrived in physics when you go to watch a movie and you start to say, that can't be real. That's bad physics. Bad science. My favorite one is probably when Lois Lane falls out of the, air, the helicopter or she's falling in the helicopter and she falls like 18 stories and then Superman catches the helicopter and slows her down within two or three stories. That would kill any human being. After falling 18 stories, calculate what your speed is. You're pretty much at like 150 miles an hour. Yep. Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory is a great movie for science. Their science is really good. They actually have a physicist, an engineer, a biologist, a chemist they have, they have on staff. On set to make sure they yes, have they do. They have they're they're on their writing staff and they're on the set as well. So when you put Amy Fowler, actually she's, that's a doctor. That's yeah, she's a I believe she's a chemist. Um, in the movie, she's a biologist or something, yeah. but she's actually yeah, a chemist. Yeah. yeah, she's actually a um, she's actually a, a professor of chemistry at a university. She came and spoke at something I was at, but I didn't get a chance to see her. Um, but I have no idea. Yeah, she has a strange name, but but yeah, it's a very good show for the science. Even uh, even if you look at the little whiteboards in their rooms and stuff. All that stuff is real stuff. It's not just something somebody just scribbled up there. Like they have these, they have these great derivations of Schrodinger's equation, derivations of this, that, and the other. You know, some great, great stuff. I mean, lots of jokes, lots of physics jokes on the whiteboards. <laughs> um, with the 
watching the movies and going, that can't happen. Um, I want to see the newest Transformers movie. <laughs> I've and never seen a Transformers movie. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be like the, the Transformers plan has somehow figured out how to move oh. and has come to Earth to try to destroy it. <laughs> and there's um, like this chamber where like, basically this is where it's happening. We oh. destroy this, we're okay. Earth is going to survive. Hey, they have like a NASA physicist. Hey, shoot this right there and then destroy it. But of course, it's a movie, and that would be yeah, it wouldn't be dramatic. So it didn't work. Yeah, my my sons my sons always want me to watch the the uh, superhero movies, but I have a hard time because I'm too I, I, I'm too. Uh, for example, what's his name? Iron Man. His science sucks. <laughs> The science of Iron Man is terrible. <laughs> Everything he does. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of well, crazy. The first movie he even acknowledges it's not even made of Iron Man. Yeah. Gold. Anyway, um, so one of the interesting things about momentum is that it does have a relationship to force, very much like energy does. You know, energy has this relationship to force through the work. If you work to if you do apply a force over a distance, you get a work, which is a type of energy. But in the case of force, you get a change in momentum over time. So if you apply a force to an object, a net force to an object, it will change the momentum of an object over a certain amount of time. So it's equal to delta momentum over delta t. But notice that the vectors are all in place. So it's something about direction as well still. Excuse me. And this is actually another form of Newton's law, Newton's uh, second law of motion. Remember that momentum is just mass times velocity. And if you, multi if you take mass times velocity divided by time, you get mass times acceleration. So this is Newton's second law in reality. The interesting thing about this is, um, is the idea of the conservation. So let's go to conservation really quick. Momentum is conserved, but because it has direction, it's a little more complicated than conservation of energy. If you're just going in a single dimension, then it's just like conservation of energy. It's just momentum is transferred from one thing to another. It doesn't change forms in, in, in so far. We've only got one kind of momentum. There are other kinds of momentum. We're not gonna deal with them quite yet. But in this case, linear momentum just becomes, just goes from one thing to another and becomes linear momentum in something else. So a car hits another car, one car may lose momentum, the other car may gain momentum, but the overall momentum of both cars, when you add them together, will be the same before and after. And as long as there's no momentum transferred out of the system. If there's momentum transferred to the earth, which there always is, then you, then you, get, you lose track of some momentum because it's hard to momentum. To, to measure momentum transferred to such a big object. So you would kind of use that as like, what's it called? I think like the silver balls. Or the... That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> but the total momentum is always going to be conserved in a system where there's no forces acting from the outside on the system. So it has to be an isolated system, very much like the isolated system with when we talk about um, when we talk about energy. But here's another example of, of an interesting thing that happens with uh, momentum. Here we have a rocket that's being launched up, and it's a two-stage rocket, which means the top is going to pop off and go shooting off. What happens to the bottom? When the top one shoots off, it actually goes up at a really, really fast momentum, much faster than it did when it blew up blasted off from the Earth. But one of the reasons for that is because this already has some momentum going up, and then it ends up pushing this one down this bottom part gets pushed down when this one gets pushed up. And so in order for this to have the same momentum with this huge piece going down, this one has to be going super fast because it's so small. It has to be going super fast up to make up for that so that that momentum is conserved. This is another great example of that. Let me get my demonstration apparatus here.
So this is a great example of this. You've seen this before. This is my rocket. Okay? This is my big part of my rocket. This is my small part of my rocket. And notice what happens when we conserve momentum. That one was flying. This one hardly moves at all, right? But that one has to be flying in order to make up for that change in momentum. So anyway, conservation of momentum, right? I didn't get that on my video, but I dropped a big, a big ball and a small ball, with a small ball on top of a big ball, and the small ball went flying off super fast. So what has this got to do with collisions? Well, simply put, you can use conservation of energy and conservation of momentum to figure out unknowns in collisions. You have beginning velocities, you have ending velocities, you have beginning directions, you have ending directions. You can use all of these equations to figure out what's going to happen after a collision if you know what's happening before a collision. Or you can figure out what happened before a collision if you know what happened after a collision. And this is perfect for people who are interested in law enforcement. Because if you come to an accident after a collision, you can take a look at the skid marks, you can take a look at the positions of the cars, and with a few very simple calculations, you can actually figure out how fast people were going, you can figure out who was at fault, you can figure out all kinds of things. So you have these equations, the, the momentum initially has to equal the momentum, momentum final. For elastic collisions, that means that they're going to bounce off each other perfectly. You're going to have two things to begin with, and the same two things to end with. But in inelastic collisions, you're going to have two things that stick together. And that happens a lot with car crashes. Car crashes where the cars stick together in the end, and so you have an inelastic collision. Well, what's the difference? The difference comes in the equations. So if you go back to our elastic collisions where they bounce off each other perfectly, you have conservation of energy. Kinetic energy in the system gets conserved. So if you add up all the kinetic energy at the beginning and all the kinetic energy at the end, it will be the same. So you can use that. You can add up the kinetic energies at the beginning, set them equal to the kinetic energies at the end, and solve for whatever you don't know. But also momentum is conserved in, in elastic collisions. In fact, momentum is conserved in every situation in the universe. So it's always conserved. So you can use those two equations. And in the end, you get this equation, momentum is conserved. And this equation, kinetic, oh sorry, that, that is momentum is conserved. And then this equation, kinetic energy is conserved for two objects. And that's beautiful. You have two equations and usually you have two unknowns, you can solve it. Um, let's actually do one really quick. Here is, a, here is an example of two objects in an elastic collision. Mass one, mass two, velocity one, velocity two. One of them is stopped, one of them is moving. These two are, are just the masses, right? So we want to solve for the final velocities of these objects using these, these equations. The first equation is momentum. Notice that their momentum 2 is just 0, so we leave it out of the equation on the left-hand side. Momentum 2 initially is 0. They're using uh, P1 and P2 for the initial momentums, P1 prime and P2 prime, so a new way of writing things. Just so you know, we do this all the time in physics. Um, that's what you get when you plug in the actual values for the momentums. Notice they're not plugging in numbers yet. And then conservation of kinetic energy. You get a very similar equation. The kinetic energy of the second one is zero at the beginning, so just leave it off. And then you solve these two equations for things that you need to know. You can solve uh, the first equation for V2 prime in terms of V1 and V1 prime. And then you can solve uh, and then you can solve the second one, you'll get a quadratic equation. They don't really show you that one. But then the quadratic equation is solved and you get two answers for V1 prime. You choose which one you want and then you plug it into the previous equation to get V2 prime. And it's actually not that hard. However, in elastic collisions, it turns out differently because kinetic energy is not conserved in, elastic, in inelastic collisions. When things stick together, Kinetic energy is never conserved, and you can do the calculations and then do the experiment, and you'll, it'll be very obvious. But what does happen is momentum is still conserved, but the momentum of the two separate objects before becomes the momentum of a single object after. In other words, the masses are combined afterwards. 
So the equation becomes different. Let's see if we use... You could kind of think of it like... Um, like a, like a T force equation or opposite directions on an object, whichever one is bigger, it's going to be the one that wins and momentum will work in the same way. We could think of it as winning, I suppose, but really just, you know, I would think of it more as dominating. One of them dominates over the other one more. So in an inelastic collision, here you have object one and object two to begin with, and they each have their own momentum, which is M1 V1 to begin with, and M2, V2. Those are the two momentums, right? This is momentum one. This is momentum two. To begin with. But in the end, they're stuck together. You have object one. You have object two. And they're stuck together. So the momentum, what is the momentum of this object at the end? What is momentum prime? It's going to be not V1 plus V2. P1. It's, it's not going to P1. It's well, it will be equal to P1 plus P2. But what is the what is the equation for? How would you calculate this momentum if you just knew the masses and its velocity? You would have to actually 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 have to add the masses together because they're one mass now, because they stuck together, right? So the momentum of this object is mass one plus mass two times the final velocity of the whole thing because it's all one thing. And that's really the trick here, because now these two added together have to equal this one in the end. So the equation looks like this, m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals m1 plus m2 v prime, or final velocity, right? And remember these things have directions. If you're in one dimension, the direction means that the velocities are just positive or negative. But if you're in two dimensions, you have to split them into components and you have to do the conservation of momentum in the x direction and the conservation of momentum in the y direction. You have to do it equally, right? <coughs> so <coughs> conservation of momentum is a little trickier, but it is very useful. And they don't show you the equation in the book, but they do show you right here. They, they show you this is the equation right here, and then they solve it for the final velocity right here for you. So two objects that stick together. Now, tomorrow, you're going to be doing some experiments with the little carts, the little cars. And remember the cars have those little plungers on them, like little shooting things? That's where we're going to be using them. What you're going to do is you're going to start with the cars sitting still, and then you're going to explode them apart. But what's their momentum to begin with? Zero. What's their momentum total even when they're moving and exploding? Zero. Yeah, and so the momentum of this car is going to have to cancel the momentum of this car. But you're going to do them with different masses. You're going to add some masses to some car, one car, and none to the other car. So the one that has more mass, what's going to happen to its velocity? It's going to go down while the other one is a higher velocity to maintain that zero total momentum. And you're going to measure that and see if you can confirm that momentum is conserved. Um, you'll also do some work with uh, kinetic energy, I believe, with um, collisions. So, um, that's what we're going to do for our lab tomorrow. And that's all I'm going to cover on chapter eight. Uh, we'll, we'll start, we'll, we'll do the rest of chapter eight and homework for chapter eight next week. On, we'll start on Monday. And let's see where we're at really, really quick on our calendar, just so we... <coughs> so today is the 27th. If we start chapter eight next week... How come I can't go to my next month there? That's annoying. Okay, so I'll go to my calendar and my open map. So we're here on the 27th. Next week we should be able to do all of chapter 8 on the 3rd. And hopefully start some of chapter 9 on the 5th. What are chapter 8 and 9? Those are 
this in static and torque, and then we can get to chapter 10. Um, what's that? We will not have we will not have class on the fourth of July, but we will still have our classes on the third and fifth. I believe the college is open on the third. I don't know. It's a good question. It's a good. Let's take a look at that. I don't know if the college is open to me. Um, let's see. That's kind of how our family is too. Let's see, June, July. Oh, it says North Campus is closed. I assume that means that South Campus is also closed. So we might not be able to meet next Monday, which would mean that we would have to do Chapter 8 on the 5th. I guess we don't meet on the 3rd. Chapter 8 on the 5th. Um, and then the next week we'll do 9 and 10 and have a lab. When does this class end? On the 11th of August or something like that? So we'll do 9 and 10. So let's see. 8, 9, 10. We'll try to, we'll try to crank out two chapters. Um... 11, 12, 13, we'll have enough time to finish up, I think. So it'll be, it'll be crowded towards the end, but we'll, we'll get it done. Yeah. I think we'll have to assume I should email, I'm going to email the president and see what she says, the vice president. See if she knows which if she is good for anything here. So if she's working, which you never know if they're working, um, then maybe she'll answer us here before we're done here today. But. So that's kind of where we're at. Do you guys have any more questions on homework or anything? Um, yeah, I do. On number uh we calculate the tension, like I have the number that I think would be the tension. Which, yeah, she's not even at work. Of course not. Well, they're not asking you for. They're not. They're. They're not asking you to solve for anything. They just want to. Yeah, they just want to know what the work is being done. Well, you know that the force of tension has to cancel out with two other forces, right? You have this guy on the slope, right? And there's the force that's pulling them down, which is the uh, weight parallel force, right? Mm -hmm. You have the friction that's pushing them up, and then you have the tension that's pulling them this way as well, right? Mm -hmm. So all these have to add up to be zero. You have to add those up to equal zero. Well, this city is moving at a constant velocity. Now. Right, that means their mass times acceleration has to equal zero because their acceleration is zero. So those three forces have to add up to equal zero. That's how you calculate the tension force. Right? Okay. 
because you can calculate, you just use, use the equation uh, wave parallel, which is down with the radius, plus friction, plus tension has to equal zero. Right? And you also have another equation that says your normal force, which is up, up this way, um, minus your weight perpendicular has to equal zero. And from those two equations, you should be able to figure out your tension, your friction, and everything else that you need to know. From the bottom one, you should be able to figure out the normal force, and then you should be able to plug that into the top one to figure out your friction, and then you should be able to figure out your tension from that. And the weight perpendicular and the normal force perpendicular should be the same, right? Because it's not Yeah, because this equation says so, right? Mm -hmm. You saw this equation that says weight perpendicular and normal force. Yep. So you're good. Anything else? You know, it's really funny. This uh, National Ignition Facility was one of the biggest laser projects. Here they actually show all these different things that make the lasing happen. But anyway, um, it's one of the biggest scientific projects ever. Ever has ended up costing like twenty billion dollars or some crazy number like this. And when they first, when they broke ground on the first day, with all the dignitaries there with their golden shovels and you know, all these politicians and great scientists there to break ground. This is what happened. This is so funny. Let's see if I can find the news story on it. No, uh, they're not even going to show it. So when they did the groundbreaking ceremony, I could probably find out. They found mammoth bones. Huh. Like the first, they're, they're digging with their golden shovels, and then the first tractor that comes in and starts digging this hole for the foundation of this thing, they dug right into a big mammoth bone thing. <laughs> And so they had to stop construction of this $20 billion project so that they could bring a bunch of paleontologists to excavate all these mammoths. They found like dozens of them, I guess. And they, and it got, um, it got delayed, I don't know how long, but it was hilarious. It was so funny. It was funny. So, do we have any other questions at all? Should we be done for the day? Number seven. Is this chapter seven? So this one's a power question. Remember, what is power? Energy, energy per time, right? So they don't tell us anything about kinetic energy. They don't tell us that it's going at a constant speed, for example. 
They do tell us how far it goes in how much time, but you can't assume that that's the same speed all the time. So you couldn't really, you could calculate the average power, but you couldn't calculate necessarily all the power. But we can calculate um, Uh, let's see. Well, we actually could do it that way because they've not given us any other information too. So you could do you could use the kinetic energy, I suppose. Um, well, let's see. Um, yeah, I think you could do it that way. The better way to do it is to calculate the work done to lift it up to this, to lift this elevator up. In other words, you're calculating the, the, change in, the change in gravitational potential, which yeah, I'm trying to think of, yeah, I, I think that's better because if you change, if, Remember that work is work is determined. Work either changes your potential, changes your kinetic energy, or it changes your potential. Uh, right? And while we don't know how fast it's moving, we do know the change in potential energy because we know it goes from zero h up to a certain height. And so this is just equal to negative mgh. And we know this. We know mass. We know the height. And the else, right? And then, what does it want us to know? It wants to know the power, right? So then, once you calculate that amount of work that was done, then you just divide it by the time in seconds. So that's better than, than assuming that it's going at the same speed all the time, because that will give us an exact... Because we don't actually know if it's going... We, we don't know what the change in kinetic energy is. We don't know how fast it was going in between those things. We don't know if it was going at a constant speed at any time, so... This would be the more accurate way to do it. And then divide it by time. So that is the maximum negative of the time. That's just, it's just, it's, the work that you put in gives you a negative change in, in um, potential energy. Uh, and that's, that's because what we're, what we're actually doing is we're actually Let's see if this is. We're, so in this equation, G is actually negative. So we put a negative out here so that the actual potential energy is positive. That makes sense? I think that's the way that I did it. I'm not sure if the book did it that way. Let's see if the book does it that way. No, kilograms is the proper SI unit for that. When you're dealing with signs, positives and negatives in energy, just about every book does it a little bit differently. But what it really comes down to is you have to realize that when you're doing when, when you're doing work, when a system has work being done on it sometimes, positive work should always add energy to that system. It should make it climb higher, should make it go faster, something like that, make it hotter. It should always increase the energy of the system. Negative work should always decrease the energy of the system. And that's work being done on the system. <coughs> so that's the, the most important thing to remember. How you define it in equations is completely up to the book you're using. Mr. Day. Yep. So with the, um, I'm still stuck and I'm still on number two. So the weight, I think I have the number for the weight and I found the friction. So to find the tension, you would just go weight minus friction should equal tension, right? Yes. Okay.
In what? In this one? Oh, the, the, that's watts. That's the unit. Watts, right? We use W for a lot of things. And we use T for a lot of things. We use T for a lot of things. We use every letter for a lot of things. That's another context. All right. I think I'm going to stop this recording because it's just becoming a lot of quiet time.